Okay, so in this video, we're going to look at an example of a function which is quote unquote smooth but not analytic. Um, so, to just some terminology here, which I think is a healthy thing for anyone to learn in their math education. So, um, a function f for which fn of c exists for all n is said to be smooth at c. Um, a function f for which the Taylor series of f of x, or the Taylor series of f, I guess, converges to f of x for x in some open interval around c is said to be analytic whoops at c okay so these are two different properties uh, and the reason they're different is that there exist functions which are smooth so any function which is analytic at c is automatically smooth at c so if if f is analytic at c then f is smooth at c uh, but there exist functions smooth but not analytic at a point Okay, so we're going to look at um, some example or an example of this. Okay, so this is example three. Uh, f of x equals uh, zero for x less, less than or equal to zero and e to the negative one over x for x greater than zero, right? Uh, so you can clearly see so the graph, the graph looks something like this. Oh, you should. Okay. Um, so clearly, the limit as x approaches zero from below of f of x equals the limit as x approaches zero from above of f of x, which is zero. So um, f is continuous at x equals zero. Uh, now let's show that f n zero exists and f n of zero equals zero for all n. Okay. So um, the way we do this is um, we claim for <clears throat> each n there exists a polynomial uh, such that fn of x equals e to the minus 1 over x pn of 1 over x uh, for x greater than 0. OK? Uh, and so to see this, right, so it's pretty simple. Um, so clearly 
for x greater than zero, um, f is differentiable. Uh, so, uh, so for n equals zero, set p zero to just be one, right? Clearly, so that that's kind of the base case of our induction. So this is by induction. Uh, then for n, let's see. Right, for n greater than or equal to zero, uh, fn plus one of x equals, uh, so this is, you know, f n prime of x. Uh, and so this is going to be, um, we're, we're going to use the, you know, so f n is differentiable for x greater than zero because um, e to the minus one over x and p n of one over x are differentiable, right? And that's just because, um, you know, one over x is differentiable for x greater than zero. And then so the chain rule and the product rule and all that stuff tell us that the, uh, the overall expression for fn is also differentiable, right? So then this is going to be using the product rule, we'll get, um, you know, what neg, we'll get one over x squared e to the minus one over x pn of one over x plus e to the minus one over x pn prime of one over x. And then this is just e to the minus one over x times uh, one over x squared pn of one over x plus pn prime one over x. So we can set um, p n plus one t to just be uh, um, t squared p n t plus p n prime t. And so this is, these are both clearly polynomials, right? So p n plus one is also a polynomial, right? So that finishes the proof of our claim, right? That P, so they, they actually kind of expand everything as like sums and stuff in the book. I'm gonna just avoid doing that because I think it's clear that the derivative of a polynomial is another polynomial. So um, yeah, so, so that kind of finishes the, uh, the proof of this claim, right? And now, well, okay, I guess that's not the total thing that we're trying to prove. So now what we could say is, um, so uh, consider the limit as x approaches zero of <clears throat> fn of x minus fn of zero over um, x minus zero. Uh, assume by induction that fn, uh, fn of zero is zero, right? Uh, because, you know, the base case, so we're going to make another inductive argument, right? So new inductive proof that now we, what we're trying to show is that fn of, z, fn of zero equals zero for all n. So what we're going to assume is that fn of zero is zero and then we'll prove that fn plus one of zero is zero. Okay. So then uh, we want to show that the limit, right, 
So then this, this equals the limit as x goes to zero of just f n of x over x, right? Because f n of zero is zero by the inductive hypothesis. So the limit as x approaches zero of f n of x over x equals zero, right? Um, in particular, it suffices to show that the, the, um, the right-handed limit of fn of x over x equals zero because clearly the limit Oops. Since fn of x equals zero for x less than zero, right? Because the original function was just zero when x was less than zero. So all the derivatives there are just zero. So we can just consider the limit when x is positive here. So we want to show that the limit as x approaches zero from above of um, e to the minus one over x pn of one over x over x equals zero, right? And then, so this is just um, the limit uh, of as x approaches zero of um, e to the minus one over x. Well, actually, yeah, let's see. Right, well, so um, for, yeah, how to say this? So for x sufficiently small um, pn of 1 over x. So 1 over x times pn of 1 over x is um, less than or equal to some constant times, um, let's see. Yeah, some constant times x to the negative uh, 2n plus 1. Okay, one thing I didn't mention here was that where, so the degree of pn is 2n. Uh, and if you look at this, right, the degree of this, well, rather, sorry. The degree here is um, the degree of pn. So this, the degree of pn prime is one less than the degree of pn. And the degree of pn is, is bigger. So, and then this is the degree of pn plus two, right? Because there's a t squared. So the overall degree here is degree of pn plus two. Uh, so if we assumed that, so this is like two n plus two. If we assumed as part of the inductive hypothesis that the degree of pn was two n, then we would find that the degree of pn plus one is two n plus one, right? Two n, two quantity n plus one. So that shows that the, the degree of pn by induction, that shows that the degree of pn is two n. So uh, the, then this is like, so this is some, some polynomial of degree two n in one over x. And then we multiply by one more copy of one over x. So the biggest exponent of the biggest like power of one over x in this expression is, is two n plus one. Uh, and so that's going to dominate the overall expression. It's not too hard to, to show that, that you can um, find a constant such that this is true. In fact, it's not even necessarily for x sufficiently small. Um, really, you, can, you should be able to find this constant, a constant that works uh, for all x greater than zero, I believe. Uh, it shouldn't be too difficult, um, but I'm not going to get into that argument. So we just have 
to show that um, the limit of, um, let's see. Right, right, right. That the limit of e to the negative one over x times x to the negative two n plus one as x goes to zero from above is zero. Okay. And then by changing variables to y equals one over x. This is equivalent to showing the limit as y approaches infinity of e to the y uh, over y to the 2n plus 1. Uh, or sorry, um, e to the negative y. So, so y to the 2n plus 1 over, so this is y to the 2n plus one over e to the y equals zero. And then we've actually proved in discussion that these for, these types of limits are zero, but using L'Hopital's rule also, so tells us that uh, this limit equals zero. Okay, so anyway, uh, I don't want to get bogged down too much in the details here, especially I know we didn't cover the proof of L'Hopital's rule, but I'm going to say that, uh, you know, you can always use from now on, you're free to use L'Hopital's rule, the statement of L'Hopital's rule, if you want, as long as you're using exactly the, the precise statement that's given in the book. Um, and also as long as it's like uh, not obviously, you know, disallowed by some piece of the context of whatever problem you're looking at, right? So in general, L'Hopital's rule will be allowed as long as you're using it precisely the way that it's stated in the book. Okay, and then so this also this change of variables thing is like really not that, um, there's nothing complicated going on here uh, because all, all, all we're saying is it's like, okay, um, if this is true, right, then since um, as y approaches infinity, one over x approaches zero, then it's like if you can find some capital M such that like for all y greater than capital M, this is less than epsilon, then by setting x to be less than like one over capital M, that would be forcing uh, this to be less than epsilon for x less than that capital, like one over capital M. So basically, yeah, these two limits really are equivalent and it's almost, it's almost trivial to show that they're the same. So uh, yeah, so I'm gonna just leave it at that. So the point here is that, so the moral, fn of zero equals zero for all n. So the Taylor series of f is zero plus zero over one, oops, zero over one factorial x plus zero over two factorial x squared plus and so on, right? Which is just zero identically, right? But clearly f of x is greater than zero for x greater than zero. So the Taylor series does not converge to f of x on any open, you know, negative delta, delta, or whatever, or any delta greater than zero, i.e. f is smooth, but not analytic at zero. Okay, so that's that. That's it for that example. And in the next and final video, we will look at an integral form of Taylor's theorem.